Well, good morning. All the chatter and the buzz. You know, when you bring coffee back in, everything changes, doesn't it? We're going to invite our ushers to come forward to receive your gifts and your offerings. Now, we have a finance team of four brilliant, money-minded, business-savvy, professional people that help us watch through everything that we do. You saw our slides coming up. But they always tell me, hey, be sure to remind everybody what's going on. So when you look at our budget, last year, we took a couple big strides forward in trying to become more missional. And that's always a great thing for us. And as well, we did have some facility pieces that we are trying to get caught up on. So we are ending our fiscal year. It starts again in July. And we are a little bit behind. So if you're able to do a little bit more for us, we would greatly appreciate you, appreciate you doing so. This is how we like, to, we like to end at zero and have a really great start kicking into next year. So thank you so much for that. And always your regular giving is a beautiful piece. And it's how we worship. It's how we celebrate what God's done in us and how we move our vision forward. As well, on a personal note, I want to thank you. This is a shot of me with mom. A few weeks ago, we had to head back to uh, Ontario, uh, home of some very crazy hockey fans that don't know anything about the sport at all. Uh, I just can't help myself. I just can't help it. Uh, your prayers and your support have really been amazing. This was something that we did not plan on. My mom is 87 years old. She's had flawless health. Actually, she had no records of any sickness in her life. And so for her to be diagnosed with uh, a stage four liver cancer very fast... Uh, she is very peaceful. She has no pain. And we are having incredible family moments together. But thank you so much for me personally. Uh, I'm usually really good at helping people in these moments. And I am completely useless as a son trying to be any form of a pastor. I just have to be, I just have to be me to mom, which is the boy who gets in trouble. Because I want to encourage you, while I was visiting Ontario, she was able to still discipline me at 87 years old. <laughs> Some of you just don't find that surprising at all. We're uh, jumping into our new series uh, this week, Plot to Us. And you know, this is like icing on a cake for me. I mean, it's an amazing piece because we're going to tell stories. We're going to talk about what happens in the journey. And this is one of those messages, no matter what, we're all in on this. This is our journey together. And we're going to see how that unfolds today. And when we think about uh, the plot twist in people's lives and changes. And, you know, even when I think of our staff, you know, one of the most amazing pieces, I mean, you just can't get two better good-looking people than this. You can see the, your photos online. If you're even doubting this picture, there's just amazing shots of all of you. But as you get to know our staff, you hear these wonderful stories of love. But after a while, you start to ask yourself some questions because it just doesn't seem to line up. You've got Adam who's working over for Africa, in Africa, working for Hands at Work and diligent in his job. And then you have this beautiful, innocent girl who's on a trip to just find out what God has for her and her journey. And somehow they meet each other and magically it comes together and they land back in town. But I'm convinced that somebody wasn't doing their job because Adam's job was to take the tour and help everybody find their way. I don't think the job was to select a wife. But I'll leave it there. We are on a plot twist and we are trying to sort out all the details of these journeys. Now, somebody who I was able to help get back in shape earlier in my life. Oh, you're so kind. You actually think I would do that <laughs> or that I could do that. This is my friend, Stefan. Stefan uh, was felt called at an early stage of life in his uh, journey to be a UFC fighter. And so he had applied for that. He was accepted into the early days of the UFC. And uh, that was his journey. That was his lot in life. And he wrote this a while ago and, and sent this to me. He said, Bobby boy, thank you for showing me how to have a relationship with my heavenly father. How to pray, show grace, and believe uh, when it seems impossible. And of course, my favorite line at the end, I love you like cooked food. <laughs> and let me tell you, he loves cooked food. There's something about the journey change when we think about our lives and what God does with us. And, and because you guys are so wonderful, I just have to take two more minutes and waste your time with a really funny story because Bob started it when he talked about baptism. For those of you that didn't grow up in church, I mean, baptism is just one of those beautiful, significant pieces. We'll touch on it again towards the end of the message. But when you grew up in church world, especially traditional church, baptism always had problems. Now, for West Side, we don't get it wrong. We just, everything flows and smooth and communicates and it just works. But boy, when you grew up in little church and medium churches, sometimes baptism is the time there's going to be a big blow up or a mistake or somebody's going to touch the microphone and get a zap. I mean, there's just so many. Now, this is, of course, when we're younger in church. And 
When you think back to one of the churches in Stouffville, Ontario, they had a baptismal tank built right in. Not hot tubs like we do, but built right in. And for those of you in the old days, do you remember? They were right in the middle, and often they had a glass wall about that tall. And so you could see, it was a little more, you'd see the water kind of rip a little bit. And then there was the entrance way into the baptismal tank. And then there was the exit. How many of you kind of remember something like that? Okay, a few of you. So you're, the rest of you are going to really appreciate this. So you get your candidates all lined up and they've got their gowns or whatever they wear and the pastor's in the tank and one comes in at a time and then they leave. And then another one comes in and then they leave. One Sunday, uh, the team forgot to unlock the exit door. And my friend, who was pastored for years, was in the tank and took care of the first candidate and away he went to leave, except he got up the steps, away from anybody that they could see, the door was locked. So now he has to stand for the entire baptismal service, waiting to get out of his wet suit. This is not what's supposed to happen in the class. He's smart. I will swim to freedom. <laughs> so he went down while no one was looking in the water and swam underwater, forgetting there's a glass wall for the whole <laughs> church to see. Do you know, only in church world does that just make so much sense. My friend said, Bobby, it wrecked the moment. But he got out and that was amazing. When we think of plot twist, it happens for all of us. And we were all in this journey of the plot twist together. And I want to read one of the most amazing stories of a changed life. It's the story of Saul's conversion and Paul on the road. It says this, Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and he asked him for letters to the synagogue in Damascus. It was there that he found, he was looking for and found those who belonged to the way, the followers of Jesus, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him and he fell to the ground and he heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I'm Jesus, who you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless and they heard the sound, but they didn't see anyone. And Saul got up from the ground and when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind. He did not see nor eat and have anything to drink. In Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called him in a vision. Ananias Yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on the street called Straight and ask for a man of Tarsus named Saul. For he is praying and in a vision he has seen a man named Ananias come from a place and lay hands on him to restore his sight. Lord, Ananias said, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm that he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he has come here with the authority from the chief priests to arrest all who call upon your name. What he's saying is, I'm not big on your next plan, God. This one I'm not liking. But the Lord said, Ananias, go. This man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and to their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he could see again. He got up and he was baptized. After taking in some food, he regained his strength. You see, great stories have great ingredients. They have all these pieces together as we start to let the story unfold. It's amazing when we look at the movements of Jesus, both ones that he initiated and others that initiated to him. They came with interesting interruptions along his journey and his path that he traveled. Because Somewhere Christ knew that the interruption would change a soul forever. An interruption would change a direction, a pathway of a life forever. Jesus did all of his work 
on wells, at funerals, boats, pathways, trees, crowds. And now God intercepts using Jesus. He intercepts in the situation with blindness another plot twist. In our story of the Apostle Paul, we see something interesting when we look at all of the characters, as we do in any other story. We have to review all the pieces. You know, you're watching something on television or you're, you're enjoying some type of movie and quickly as the storyline goes, you start to connect to certain people. You see yourself. You wonder what that personality is going to do and you're caught up in the story. Well, let's look at just a few of the players that we have in our story today and see where you would find yourself. Go through the checklist and see which person may be you. Paul, a Pharisee, a tent maker by trade, hated the Christians as he believed that the teachings of Jesus violated the Mosaic law. Paul was heading down the right path that he believed, but not the path that God had intended for him. The question out of his life is this, what are you doing great, but going the wrong direction? You're doing it well. He was good at what he was doing, just doing the wrong thing. Now, it was interesting, 10 years ago in my own life, I was a little bored in church world. I, there wasn't enough vision and enough stuff going on that was really keeping me busy. The things that I felt called to do, this were not happening anymore. And so I thought, I know what I'm going to do because I've always loved business. My dad was in business. I'm going to, I know what I like. I'm going to buy a Subway franchise. So I did some research found one available that wasn't too far away from where we were, and I had to upgrade my math classes. That was the biggest piece in order to get that together. Interesting that while I was in that process, I was doing all the right things, but completely going the wrong way. Now, I didn't have a blinding light or something happened to me on the road. I had something better. It's called a wife. They have a wonderful way of correcting things when your brain goes kind of sideways. And she said, what are you thinking? And then an interesting light did come on. For those of you who love carbohydrates and eating, maybe a sandwich business is not your best move. Sushi, sushi yes, sandwiches no. So we moved away from that. And God, as after he realigned my life, it wasn't long before I landed here in the West and have been incredibly busy ever since. When we think about our journey and we walk together, what does it look like that we are doing or you are doing that could be not exactly what God has planned for you? The second character is, is God, Christ there. He has a plan for all. He has a plan for each one of us that he wants to see unfold for you to reach the potential that you have. And it doesn't matter what age you are. It doesn't end. It does not change. I want to pause and say this, that there's something that we've missed in church world because some of us were raised that we had to do all the work for God. And that's problematic. But we participate, but God does the work. It's the Spirit of God that encounters a soul, a life, and does the changing. And then we have a job to walk with that. We don't drive that in any way, shape, or form. Now, for some of you, look at Ananias and say, well, that's, that's probably perfect for me. I'm a disciple. I'm learning. I've articulated my faith in God and my ability to walk on that journey, in the journey with God. But like Ananias, we get asked as disciples to do things that we're not all that excited about at times. We hear God's voice and we say yes. And we hear God in a vision or we see what it can unfold. And we say, absolutely. And then we put the facts together and say, whoa, 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 you want us to do what? I get the dream. I get the idea. I see where you're going. I'm not sure I want to be the one in this. That's discipleship. That's learning. That's apprenticeship. Let me say it this way. For us here at church, you start with a visit. You pop in the door. And you go, wow, this is a cool environment. This isn't too difficult to understand. And wow, we've got coffee. This is an excellent start from what I didn't do when I was growing up in church. And then the band plays, and that's just sneaky business. Like as if that's normal going all the time. You guys have so much talent, it's just scary. And all of a sudden, I could do this. 
I think I'm thinking about the church thing. I'm going to start down this road. And then the teaching comes out and more worship and more pieces and grow seminars. And all the stuff comes to her. And then all of a sudden you say, John, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to volunteer. I'm going to try this out. And once a year, maybe it's, a, maybe it's one of our events in the summer, or coffee or shaking a hand at the door, or children's ministry, youth, whatever that is, you're going to get involved. You go, this is great. I'm starting to know if you, and then I'm going to take another step. I'm going to go on a mission trip and get a what? Or, no, sorry, that was early on. I think I covered that. Uh, I'm going to go on a mission trip and I'm going to follow after God's heart to care for people outside of my own zone. And you just keep moving forward. And all of a sudden, then they start passing this thing out called a little offering thing. And you think, boy, oh boy, now this is really stretching. Like, you mean I've got to put a little money into this? Like, wait a sec. But what you're doing is you're moving forward and growing, progressing in your walk with God, sharing in the vision of what we're doing. But along that journey, each spot can stretch us. That's discipleship. Now, for some of you, Judas is the perfect, he's the perfect player. Here's the guy that opens up his house. Oh, this makes perfect sense. But I want to pause with Judas and say this. Do you know often we forget the gift of hospitality? We, you've taken it for granted over the last number of years because we just keep having bigger and better parties everywhere we go. You can't do a Wesley thing. Did you hear Bob's announcement? Please come out this week. We have a dinner together before we even start teaching you. That's what we've become. We have got it. Community, sharing together, eating together, and we do it great. But we can never forget the gift of hospitality. Now, let me tell you a little secret. Not all of you have the gift. Some of you want the gift, but you don't have it. Now, there's a little test to know whether you have it or not. You have to do one party. And you get the food all ready. You give marching orders to the whole family. Everybody comes over and everybody loves everything you've done. But the test is when they leave. When everything leaves and all the oxygen goes out of the room and you scream at your kids, punch your husband and step on the dog, you don't got the gift of hospitality. <laughs> it's been a drain. It's been a bad thing. When you've got it, you just love it, and people feel that gift. And when you have it, it's a beautiful, beautiful piece. For some of you, you say, you know what? I could do that. I think I'd be okay to let that hospitality thing roll. I think I'd like to try that out. And then as we go further in the story, which we don't have time today, there's a few other characters I want to introduce you to, Aquila and Priscilla. I think I'm later in the story, but they are also business owners. And I think, and I'd love to teach further on this one day, I think it's amazing that Paul, a tent maker, meets Aquila and Priscilla, tent makers as well. There's something about coming together, and I watch it here, oil and gas people, company owners, uh, of, uh, engineers and marketing strategy people and private business people and doctors, nurses, lawyers. When you guys get in the same arena together, just like us as pastors, we connect because we understand the same journey together. And here we have an incredible principle that Paul, after he is on the way after the twist of his life, God brings him together to wrestle the faith with like-minded people of their giftings. We get stretched all the time with different people in, the, in different rooms, but this one they are doing together. And of course, the last piece of the journey, the last person that we can talk about today is Barnabas. He's the coach. He's the one that goes ahead of Paul and says, Paul, now just put it on pause for a second. I got to go meet the Christians who you were going to kill. And we're going to talk them through to let them know that you're the guest speaker. It's all going to go okay. Then he goes and meets the Christians and said, now listen, I know the guy that was out killing all of you is coming next week. And, and I know it sounds like a really weird thing, but something's happened in his life. And he's a good guy now. I don't know if we could get that one well attended even here at Westside. But what happens is he goes between. And then when he's done, he's coaching Paul. Paul, you did great. That was great. Hey, maybe dial that part down, but maybe lift that part up. And he's the encourager. I so love being with you. It's amazing. I'm so honored to be a part of your life. When we look at all of the personalities, and you know I love this stuff. It just is amazing. Extroverts are weird people anyways, but we love all the personalities. We're afraid of many of the personalities. We're interested in many of the personalities, but we love them all. Well, maybe not all. The dreamers. I don't like these people. We need them. I get it. They're the ones that are probably most like Jesus. But boy, they're slow. Could you dream while you go? Could you dream a little while you're walking? You know dreamy people. You show them a little practical thing and they say, Do you know, if we were just able to, and then all of a sudden it starts to unfold and life stops and it's, 
It's just too slow for me. Then you've got the creative people, and I'm part of that group, and man, we're a mess. I can't do the same recipe twice. I like to move furniture around. I like to change stuff up. There's just no routine with creative people. Everything can be done in color and colorful words and colorful things. And we're just a unique group. And then you've got the movers and the shakers and the doers. And, and I, honest confession, I love the doers. I love the people that just get it done. Don't come and ask, just get it done. But what happens is we have all these different types of people. But the encouragers, they're the gold ticket. And, and I don't know, I'd love to do a study on this. I think I might have it figured out, but I, I don't know if I want to figure it out. The encouragers either led by God always come through at the right time. Or we just always love encouragers. They're, you're just having a moment. You're not sure. You're second guessing. Something has thrown you a curveball and boom. It's an encourager. Little text message. And when it's an encourager, you know who they are. You quickly take it. If the phone's ringing and it's an encourager, what do you do? You pick it up. If it's not, you go to voicemail. Because you don't know. Are you ready for it? Can you take the criticism? Can you take the challenge of the mover and the shaker and the pusher? But if it's an encourager, whoa, hello, yes. When I was a youth pastor, and that's not easy work. I had an encourager. He was one of the kid's parents. He was a school teacher. And he would call me all the time. How's the greatest youth pastor in Canada? And I would say, I don't know. I hope he's doing well because it can't be me. And then I figured it out. He thinks it's me. Oh, I could take his call all the time. Parking lot would empty after church and I'd want to just stand around. Maybe he'll come encourage me again. This was Barnabas. One of the most beautiful roles when we think about all of these people. Where do you find yourself in the story? What personality kind of fits better to you? A couple of pieces and then we're done. I want to say this, distractions, although difficult, especially if you're a planner, especially if you're an organizer, especially if you're a certain type of personality, they are the only way to get you to the street called straight. Straight meaning we want to be on track with what God's doing. But the distraction is what makes it happen. And none of us like distractions. I'm on the way to church this morning. My son's at a sleepover since last night. No problem getting him out of bed because it's someone else's issue to deal with. My daughters are up ready to go. They're working in the children's program this morning. It's a beautiful Sunday. And not one mile from my house, somebody decided to stop in the middle of the road. No blinkers, no signs, no blown motor, no traffic, no pedestrians, no dogs in front of them. I know what I'm going to do today. In the middle of fog, I'm going to stop. I honked the horn, I screamed at him out the window and then said, please join me at church this morning. <laughs> no, no matter what, I'm preaching today, talking about distractions and I couldn't get, like, you're in my way, I gotta go, I gotta get to the church. What if God had something big for me to do right there? I missed it again. Distractions aren't easy, but a, a divine distraction leads to divine destiny in the changes and the life moments of people. Saul on the route to kill, blinded and now laying in a bed, but escorted out to his future by those he was opposing. Think about it. The second part is this. Your spot is in the part of the plot. You have a spot or a place in the plot. We do this together. In fact, I would say it this way. You can't change your own story if you aren't willing to get involved in someone else's story. When I read the Bible, I ask questions. If God can blind somebody on the side of the road and completely distract them from the direction they're going, he could have done it all right there. Paul could have had everything he needed and just went ahead. But for some reason, God said, I need one of those, one of those, one of those, one of those. We all participate in the plot. God shows us that he's a big deal. And we can get that. You could say, oh, I'm there. God is a big deal. He's big. He's just a big deal. But your value is also a really big deal in God's eyes. And the role that you play in other people's lives is even a bigger deal. 
little moments, little pieces, whether that's the house, the laying on of the hands, being a part of the vision, whatever that is, your role is significant. But sometimes our own blindness of our own situation gets in the way. I normally like to tell a lot of funny stories, but this one is not so funny. When I was 19 years old, I was sensing the call into full-time ministry. And when I was sensing the call, I started to pray a little bit more. And when I was praying and talking to God, I said, God, here's what I'm going to start doing right now more than ever before. I want you to use me every single day. God, every day, I don't want to go to bed at night without knowing that you used me in the life of someone else's moment. I want to be there for other people. And then I had to get a job because I had to pay for school. So I went to St. Joe's Hospital. And I went there and I filled out an application. And while I was filling out an application, there was an older soul beside me and he was having one tough life. And while I'm writing down, being very careful to spell everything right, he starts telling me his sad story. And I gave the best response ever. Yep, ooh, life's tough. Ooh, sure tough to be you. Yep, 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 yep. Not even two hours before I'm going to be used by God and give me the situation. I'm your man right now. And then I filled the application, wished, wished him well, walked down the corridor, and I got outside. And God hit me like a ton of bricks. Really? I thought we had a deal this morning. You wanted me to put people in front of you to care for and to pastor and to practice on before you even go to school. And the best you can bring to the table is, yeah, I get it. Life's tough for you. And I realized I completely missed it. I think about the story often because I wanted to make it right. And I got in my car and I drove three full circles around St. Joe's Hospital in London, Ontario. And I never saw that person again. I wish I could tell you that I met him in the parking lot afterwards and we had a beautiful moment. We walked to church together and now he's leading a church of 10,000 people in somewhere in the U.S. There's no good ending on this story. The only good ending is, is I learned that I have to move quickly and try to look beyond my own stuff to be used by God. It's the street called Straight and we're all being stretched. Homes, hospitality, hearts, and our hands. God wants it all. He wants to use everything that we have. It's an amazing part of our journey. Do you know, it's interesting when we go through life, we have it all planned out. We've got it all sorted. We know exactly what's going to happen. And then all of a sudden, the plot twists. Something changes we weren't planning on. Suddenly, there's a shift. For some of you, the marriage that you thought was going to happen didn't. Some of you decided to be single and you've now in love with that and you're going, wow, I thought I'd have a, you know, a husband or a wife and multiple kids and now I'm going, I just love the life of them, but this is what I didn't plan on. Some of you marriages went tough. They went the other way and you're processing through that. Others, it's been a career change. It's been amazing. Others, it's been a career shift that hasn't been amazing. Either way, you found faith. It was interesting a year ago, Mark and, and Tamara, they're uh, just an amazing part of our church here and an amazing story of what God's doing to them. And Mark came to me and said, man, I don't know what happened. All of a sudden I pumped the brakes and thought I should retire and boom, everything changed. I'm a little bit lonely. I don't know what to do. I got this time on me. What do I do? And I introduced them to two scary people in this church, Cam and Jim. Now I gave them a little preface. I said, they're both at either ends of the spectrum, but these are both high level business people that did the same thing as you. Hang on to your hat. He needed an Aquila and a Priscilla to walk with him and say, help me understand what I'm doing at this stage of my life because the plot shifts, it changes on us. Then we start to move forward. We move into what God is doing as we do it together with other people. Next week is baptism. And here's what we know. We know that there won't be anybody swimming across the glass wall as much as we'd like to pay money to be able to see that. It's not gonna happen here. Here's what else we know. We know that every person that steps into that water and publicly confesses their faith, they will never be the same again. Because the plot's twisting. This is another part of their spiritual journey as they are walking together. Paul, Ananias, Judas, Aquila, Priscilla, Barnabas, you and I, and even Don Westman and Judy. Watch this video with me. Judy was a uh, force of nature, just a 
bundle energy, um, just a real beautiful soul. And uh, obviously what attracted me to her was, was just that life and light that came from her. Anybody that knew her would just say they were, you know, probably she was their best friend or just somebody they could always talk to, just so open and loving and wise. We were married for 25 years until, uh, you know, I did lose her to, to breast cancer. She was never uh, mad at God. Uh, you know, I, I'm sure she questioned, but the thing that, that, that stuck to me was she, she never said, why me, God? She always said, why not me? There's no rule book for how you handle it, and everybody's different. Grief doesn't have a timetable. It really taught me a lot about the power of the church and the community and, and those who, who come around you in those moments because there's a, a love and acceptance of each other for where we're at um, as opposed to where we need to be or where we want to be. Um, and willingness to be there for each other along that journey. It's an incredible story when the plot twists. The power of every story is that sometimes the twist that happens is not what we planned on. Sometimes our stories, even in the middle of grief and growing out of pain, create incredible stories that other people have been changed by. It was a week following Judy Westman's passing and a funeral here of over 700 people that there's been many lives that have been touched because of it, and I wanted to shed just a little bit more light as we close on the story of Dennis and Wendy Schofield. You'll see their faces here a lot. They, they're uh, quite busy at this season in their life, and God's brought them down an incredible new road. But it was the Sunday following with Dennis and Wendy that I want to talk to you about. I pulled into the parking lot, and they were sitting in their car. And when they sat together, I jumped out of the car, and I looked at them, and I said, you're either this morning's guest speaker or you're lost, because it makes no sense that you're here this early. And he looked at me and he said, you don't know us, but we came to Judy Westman's funeral last week and we want to come to church, but we're not good enough. We're not good people. We're not church people, but we so want to come. Would it be okay? Oh, I dragged him in the door. I showed them every inch of this facility. Then they started attending. And a month into it, we were having communion. Dennis came back to the back and said, we don't know much about communion, but I'm pretty sure we're not good enough for communion. I said, oh, Dennis, that's the beautiful of Christ and the cross and the broken part. You're good enough. God says you don't have to have it right. That's what communion does. And so he went back to the front and he said, Wendy, we can do communion too. And then he came back and he said, we can't do communion. I said, why not? I told you you're okay. He said, Wendy's gluten-free. She can't have the gluten. <laughs> so I said, well, you'll have to find another church. We're unable to serve you. No. <laughs> we, we sent out our volunteers quickly before the communion time happened. We ran to Santerra. We got some gluten-free something. We broke it up, and she was the first gluten-free person in our communion service here at Westside King's Church. We didn't know we had to have those details. And then they did something incredible. They signed up to every single thing that you could be a part of here. They wanted to grow. They wanted to learn. In fact, I even think that one year they actually did a polling station here and participated with the community because they thought it was part of our church. <laughs> they did everything. And then he went on his first missions trip to Africa. Health not great, but a bunch of men in this church, part of the men's group, got around and said, we're going to write checks. We're going to pay for this for you. You got to get on a missions trip. And away he went. And when he was there, God spoke to him. And it's been now four years. He's gone almost two to four trips a year, helping build an orphanage, helping encourage people over there. He has found his peace in life that God had for him. The plot for Dennis radically shifted. You connect, you grow, and then you serve, and then you find yourself, wow, 
I never dreamed that this would be for me. You know, it's interesting. You think that you're done often at different seasons in life when the plot is twisting. You feel even that God is distant from us. But I want to encourage you today that in that moment, God is probably way closer than you can ever imagine. And you have come to the right place. You've come to the church, the place where Jesus is in the business of rewriting stories. And that's what he's done for all of us. And that is what he is continuing to do. And let me encourage you today that in the business of rewriting stories, Jesus' business is booming. It's growing exponentially because that's what he does so well. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you. You are so wonderful to us and often we miss it. We miss the part that you're doing in us and you are stretching and journeying us as disciples, as new visitors to the message of the gospel. But God, there's a dentist in every church. It doesn't matter what part of the story, there's something you're doing to bring change into the hearts and the lives of your people. So God, we pray that that would be our story here. That would be the visional piece that continues to always happen. That as the plot shifts and changes, we are walking together into the very best peace that you have for our life. We thank you for each person and the journey that they are on right now today. Be with us as we move forward in your wonderful name. Amen. Amen. We'll have a fabulous afternoon as your plot continues to twist. We will see you again next week.